Well, it is the Word of God that we now turn our attention to, so I would encourage you to grab your Bible. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, if you have an electronic copy, certainly use that. Or if neither one of those are available to you, uh, there should be Red Pew Bibles under some of the chairs in front of you, if you can reach one of those. And if you'll turn to page 727, you'll find uh, Luke chapter 4. That's where our text is this morning. We continue in this series. I began last week, Temptation and God's Prevailing Word. And um, I'll read our text in a few moments and pick up with the series. Then I just wanted to say thank you to you, church. Uh, it's been, it was 12 years ago this week that my wife and I and our three boys moved here and began our ministry among you and, and with you. And we, we have been honored. Uh, we are amazed, my wife and I both, as we look back and see all that God has taught us and revealed to us uh, and done in and through us. Uh, during our time here, and uh, it's, it's an incredible privilege for sure. We love you guys. We thank you for loving us. It's been an honor to see our boys uh, grow and finish their uh, grade school years here, and all three of them went to uh, uh, Louisiana Tech and completed their studies there, and, and they're mostly out of the house. The third one, the middle one, y'all know, came home a few months back because he finishes schooling in physician's assistant school, but praise the Lord, he has a job. And, uh, and he'll be leaving in January. See, that's, that's the way I feel about it. Um, it, it, it's, kind of, it it's mixed emotions. Uh, not with me. Uh, what it is, is is my wife is mourning that he's going to be leaving, and I'm excited he's going to be leaving. So there's mixed emotions in the home. Um, but we are excited for him. And, but again, my point of saying all this was to say thank you to you and just really celebrate God uh, for what he has done and, and who he is among us. And, and we, we long for, for seeing what he does in the days ahead as well. Uh, we also celebrated our 33rd anniversary this week, uh, 33 years, yeah. Um, she says most of them were good, and um, so no, I, I forbid her to say that, and, uh, and, and it drives me crazy when I hear people say things like that, um, unless it is in jest or whatever, but, um, because marriage, marriage is good. Marriage is not always easy and perfect, though, um, but it's good, and we, we somehow, through God's grace, love each other today more than we've ever loved each other. And uh, love being together more than we've ever loved being together. And I think that's why I want the kids completely out of the house. Because I like, I like being, I just like being out yesterday. We got in the car and we just went. And we, we did some things together. We didn't have to, oh, we got to feed Adam. Oh, we got to feed, the, you know. <laughs> no, man, we just go. Let's love that. So some of y'all are back there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You've been there. And others have dream of that day. Good luck. One day. It'll happen for you too. Well, uh, let me read our text this morning, um, and, and I know uh, you just momentarily ago sat down, but uh, would you stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning? Beginning with verse 1, Luke chapter 4, Scripture says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit of the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Father, this is your word, believing it to be true and relevant to our lives, Father. Now speak to us through your word, and may we, Father, listen to you and respond accordingly in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Now last week I showed you that by not succumbing to the temptations, Jesus proved he can conquer sin and the devil. 
If Jesus himself was not impervious to sin, then he could not be the pure and spotless sacrifice sufficient for the atonement of our sins. If we are to believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, then we need to know that he has the ability to conquer sin and the devil. If we're going to place our eternal trust and hope in Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection, then we need to know that he can do what he said he can do. And so we see in our text this morning, once again, a beautiful demonstration of what Jesus has done on our behalf to be able to prove and show himself to us. Today, I want you to see the sovereignty of God in our text. And I want you to see how the devil loves to tempt us, to persuade us, to lead us away from trusting in that sovereignty and instead choosing to have control over our own lives. And by God's sovereignty, this is what I mean. God's sovereignty means that he has ultimate power and authority so that he is always in complete control and can accomplish whatever he pleases. Verse 1 tells us Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. You see, Jesus didn't accidentally wander into the desert. He was purposely taken there for a deliberate, divine, epic battle to take place between him and his number one enemy, the devil or Satan. This epic battle was part of God's plan. While it was the devil who thought, ha, I've got Jesus right where I want him, he failed to realize that it was the Spirit of God that led Jesus to that particular place for a particular purpose and reason. See, everything happens in our lives underneath the watch care and even the approval of our sovereign God. Yes, not just the good, but even the bad things that happen to us, they don't happen outside of God's watch care. And we may not understand it at the moment. We may not even understand it throughout our entire lifetime why some of the experiences we go through happen to us. But you can know this from Scripture, from this passage, and from other passages as well, that God is a sovereign God. He's a, he's a big God. And even though our lives sometimes seem or appear to be out of control, they're not beyond his awareness and even his approval. He is watching over all of his creation. We know that in John chapter 19, when Jesus was arrested, Pilate began to question him, and Jesus was not answering Pilate's questions sufficiently. And so Pilate said to Jesus, don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And look on the screen. This is what Jesus said back to him. He said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. You see God's sovereignty there. Many of you in this room know the story in the Old Testament of Joseph, Joseph excuse me, and how his brothers became jealous of him, and they wanted to get rid of him, so they eventually just sold him into slavery, thinking they were rid of him forever, wouldn't have to deal with him ever again. But God divinely brought him through his time of slavery and, and, and to a point to where he ultimately had a position and authority, and God used Joseph to be able to provide food not just for his family, but also for all of God's people during a severe famine. And later he would eventually be able to speak to his brothers about the incident. And he would say this to them in Genesis 50. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. The psalmist understood God's sovereignty. He says, I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth and the seas and all their depths. In the Old Testament, there was a Babylonian pagan god named Nebuchadnezzar who, Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, who had a huge pride problem. But after a particular humbling personal experience that he went through, he came to say this about God. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. 
He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? So you see the sovereignty of God, how big our God is over and over all throughout Scripture and even in our own personal journeys through life as well. Verse 2 says that Jesus was tempted by the devil. So it was the spirit that led Jesus into the desert, but it was the devil who tempted Jesus. And it's important to understand that this Greek word, paraso, is neither negative nor positive, meaning that it can mean either to test or prove, or it could also mean to tempt or entice or seduce. And the particular interpretation determined or is determined, excuse me, by the intentions of the one who's doing the testing or the tempting. And if it's always used in the sense of revealing the validity or the integrity of one's devotion or of faith to God. And so it's it's the same word, and you, you see it in, throughout Scripture used in, in different way. One of the two ways, in Hebrews chapter 11, we're told that Abraham was tested, paraso, by God. But here in Luke 4, we see that the word is translated tempted. Because it's the devil who has evil intentions on his mind. So the Spirit led Jesus into the desert for positive, for testing, for purposes that would divinely be used by God, but it was the enemy that came along who tempted him, and he had evil intentions upon his mind. Now, you may say it strikes you kind of funny that the Spirit would lead Jesus into the desert. We tend to think that the Holy Spirit would would never lead us to places where we would not be safe, but we have to be honest about this. The spiritual journey that each and every one of us are on who are following Jesus Christ, there are times. There are times when we are purposely being led into circumstances or situations within our journeys that are not safe. They're they're not comfortable. They're, They're not easy. One of the most popular Psalms is Psalms 23. Oh, we love the phrase the psalmist writes when he speaks of God leading him to uh, leading him besides quiet waters. But in that same psalm, he also acknowledges that he will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So there are moments in our lives, and sometimes we find ourselves in these difficult circumstances in life. Sometimes that's because we brought them on ourselves, either because we involved ourselves in sin or we chose an unwise choice. But it is also sometimes true that God will navigate our lives purposely for a reason. Maybe for our own benefit, maybe also for the benefit of others as well. They're not easy. But in those moments, God is testing us through these difficult circumstances as a way of proving our devotion to Him and as a way of strengthening our commitment to Him. Just as the Spirit led Jesus into the desert for an intense time of testing, we too may find ourselves at various points in our life in difficult times of testing as well. And it is through these experiences that God then is able to show us what's really inside of us. It's through these kinds of experiences that God is able to reveal what it is that's, that's, that's preventing us from, from being the, the, the person he's called us to be or created us to be or, or the, what it is that's, that's blocking our intimacy with him or what it is that's keeping us from, from faithfully or obediently following him. And so God uses difficult moments sometimes to reveal these things to us. Scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 1, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. When you find yourself Facing difficult circumstances in life, 
first begin to seek in, within yourself and look and see if you're experiencing them as a result of, of some action or decision that you have personally made. And, and if you cannot find anything to confess or a behavior to change, then seek God to provide the strength and the grace that you would need in order to get through those difficult moments. And you see in verse 3, the temptation that the devil leveled against Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Last week, I showed you from Scripture that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. When Jesus left the splendor of heaven and was born as a baby, he did not cease to be God, but instead set aside for a period of time some of his attributes in order to become fully human. In other words, he took on the body of, of a man, and he chose to live in that body, and that body required him to be able to, to take food in. He had to have food in order for his body to, to stay well, just as our bodies need food. For sustenance. And in verse 2, it says that Jesus had gone 40 days without eating. And he was hungry. 40 days. Now our minds, first of all, to say, well, how can he go 40 days? Oh, he was fully God. Well, it's his body that was going 40 days. But we know from Scripture that he was, he was, he was, being filled with the Spirit. He was finding his sustenance through the Spirit of God. But physically, he still was hungry. That's important to acknowledge and to, to realize. And some people struggle with that. Oh, Jesus never got hungry. He was God. He was in a human body. He got hungry. If Jesus didn't get hungry, then he doesn't understand our hunger. So yeah, he was hungry, it says here. And knowing that Jesus was hungry, the devil tries to get Jesus to turn a stone into some bread in order to feed himself. Very natural. And what's wrong with that? I mean, he was hungry. He'd gone a long time without food. He had been good. He had spent some quality time with his heavenly Father. And Why not go ahead and break that fast and, and go ahead and begin to Provide some food for yourself. Actually, if you think about it, at the time of this experience, just like there are today, there were many people who were homeless, who were hungry, in need of food. Why, why just turn that one stone in for bread for yourself? Turn in all these stones. And man, the whole world could have had food. Jesus, he could have been a hero. People would have been amazed at his, his power and how he was feeding people. They would have loved him. I mean, what's wrong with using the little divine power to fight world hunger? If Jesus had done so, he would have failed to defeat, defeat the devil. And though he could have provided food for every person in the world at the time, he would not have been able to provide salvation for you and me today. You see, by trying to get Jesus to turn stones into bread, the devil was suggesting that Jesus quit trusting in God's providential care and instead choose to use his own power and abilities to serve himself. You see the same temptation happening in the crowds of the people as Jesus was placed upon the cross. And they taunted Jesus by saying, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Again, it's that idea, God's not providing for you, so provide for yourself. What this is, this is the temptation of self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is a huge temptation for all of us today. Perhaps you're familiar with the common sayings, if you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. Or look out for number one. Here's the truth. Through the temptation of self-sufficiency, the devil is attacking our belief that God will take care of us. The devil wants you to suddenly get to a point to where you say, you know what? It's okay for you to do this for yourself. And he's very sneaky about it. It comes to our 
children and our teenagers. And he says simple things like everyone else is doing it. It's, it's okay. He comes to our young single adults and he says, God has forgotten about you. He, he doesn't plan on you getting into a marriage relationship, but you have desires and needs, so you go ahead and, and seek pleasure for yourself. He, he comes along to, the, to the, those who are, are married, and he very carefully and craftily, he sneaks into the lives and begins to convince the, the married person that their marriage is not fulfilling, it's, it's lacking something, and, and it won't hurt anybody if you go ahead and step out on your marriage and enter into a relationship with someone else uh, behind doors. Nobody will know, nobody will be hurt. He comes to those with same self with same-sex attraction. And he tells them that you were created this way. And if you don't embrace who you are, then you're never going to be fulfilled. You'll live a life of loneliness and hurt. And God wouldn't want you to do that, so embrace it. And That's what our devil does. He comes to people who are, who are financially struggling. Or even people with great finances, for that matter. But he comes along and says things like, you can't afford to give 10% to God. If you gave 10% to God, you, you couldn't pay all your bills. And God doesn't want you to not pay your bills. That would not be a responsible Christian. Or very subtly, he says, pay your bills first and then give to God what you have. And he manages to make sure there is nothing left. Oh, I could go on and on and on with examples of how our spiritual enemy comes into our lives and in a very sneaky way tempts us to be able to, to do tempts us to do things on our own instead of depending upon the provisional care of our sovereign big big God. And I want to take this to a little further, real briefly. Even deeper than self-sufficiency. This first temptation really is also hitting at the sense of identity. You notice that the devil said, if you are the son of God, the actual little translation is since you are the son of God. In other words, what the devil is saying here is that if you are who you think you are, then turn the stone into bread. Focusing on who we are is something that the devil loves to do to create a doubt in our identity of who we are before God. To us today, the devil may just simply come along and see if you are really a child of God, if you are really a Christian, if you really are who you think you are, and then he puts in his temptations. It's interesting that we pray and we seek for God's wisdom for each and every day. We, we're seeking him for insight and, and then we're oftentimes asking him to intervene when circumstances become difficult. But when God doesn't intervene right away, we're so prone sometimes or many times to make the decision and take action on our own. And it may be through the influence of friends. It may be over the fear that if we don't do something quickly that things may get worse. And so in our mind we begin to justify it. Actually he is so good at this that at some point he actually stops speaking to us and it's actually our own voice we're hearing now. And we're convincing ourselves. And all of it is eating away at our identity in Christ. And trusting in his providential care for our lives. Underlying the devil's temptation here is the idea that if you are a child of God, then you deserve certain rights and privileges. And when those rights and privileges are not provided for you, then you are to get them on your own. You deserve this. You have a right. And in so doing, we become self-serving. 
we have placed ourselves on the throne. We have chosen to be sovereign over our own lives instead of allowing our big, big God to remain sovereign over our lives and make an impact within our lives at that moment. The devil has millions of ways, each of them custom-tailored to yours and my own areas of pride and weaknesses within our own lives. He tempts each and every one of us in different ways, and in some ways the same way, but uniquely different in each and every one of them because he just knows things about us. It's not that he has some great mind and he's able to perceive things. He just hears us talk about things. He sees our decisions we've made already and begins to work with them. And he just works his way into our lives. The way of illustrating this, the story was told a number of years ago about a man who had settled down for the night and had just fallen asleep when his camel woke him up and told him it's very cold outside and asked for permission to simply place his legs inside the tent so that the legs could stay warm. The man said, sure, gave him permission to do so, but if half an hour later the camel woke him up again and convinced him that his head was so cold it would be best if his head was allowed to be able to come inside the tent as well, to which the man said, go ahead, and gave him permission to do so. This went on through the evening until such time the man finally woke up at one point. The camel was entirely inside of the tent and the man was crowded. He woke up the camel and told the camel, there's not enough room for both of us in this tent, to which the camel said, then maybe you should leave. See, our enemy loves to come into our lives, and he loves to take up residency. And then when we find ourselves in trouble, when we find our lives getting messed up, when we find our circumstances becoming difficult, and we suddenly realize th- something's not right, and we begin to seek a way to get out of that, we, we begin to say, okay, devil, you got to go. But instead, he looks at us and says, no, you got to go. Even when we look at him and say, there's not enough room for you, me, and Jesus. He said, well, Jesus has got to go. If today you realize that you have turned to self-sufficiency, that you're currently in a, in a season of life right now to where instead of trusting in God's providential care, you have made some decisions on your own. You have taken matters into your own hand. You have stopped waiting for God's timing and God's providential care, and you've chosen to make your own choices and decisions that I encourage you this morning to confess that to the Lord, to ask Him to forgive you, and to return to trusting that your true identity cannot be found in your self-sufficiency, but it can only be found in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in which He sovereignly watches over your life. Look at how Jesus responded to the devil's first temptation in verse 3. Jesus said, It is written, Man does not live. Excuse me, it's verse 4, isn't it? It is written, man does not live on bread alone. Now, the Gospel of Matthew actually gives us a little more information. Matthew 4.4 says, Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is quoting here from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy 8, verses 3 and 4 says this, He humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Now, manna is an unknown substance that God provided for his people. For many years, I thought manna was Krispy Kreme donuts. It just seemed like that kind of thing that would just, in the morning, was just so incredible, just melt in your mouth. But I don't think that's biblically true. But whatever it was, God provided it for his people each and every day so that they had enough for their day 
on the seventh day. They actually collected it on the sixth. Had enough for both of those days. He just provided for them in this miraculous way. But not only food. Verse 4 says that God miraculously arranged for their clothes not to wear out. Their feet did not blister or swell as they walked through the wilderness. I mean, God was taking care of them. God was seeing them through this particular wilderness experience. It was not easy, but he was providentially caring and watching over them. And so here's what I believe Jesus is declaring to us today by quoting from Deuteronomy 8. He is telling us we are better off depending on God, waiting on his provision, than we are grabbing satisfaction for ourselves when... And as we think, we need it. I was talking to somebody between the services, and I confess, man, that's one of my biggest challenges, is waiting on God's timing. Sometimes we, we know or we perceive or we think we know what should be done, but, but God's just not doing it right then. And we're thinking, well, I guess this is one of those moments where I'm supposed to do it myself then. Maybe he's even waiting on me, and that's, that's a dy- dynamic that's a struggle. When do, when do I take matters? Well, not, you never take matters on him. When do I take action, though, because God is wanting me to take the action versus not take action and simply wait on God to do something or give you the green light? And it is a delicate, delicate matter. And the more you know God and his ways, the better you can determine and answer those questions for your own personal life. But we know from Scripture that for 40, for 40 years, God's people were able to eat every day of their lives. They didn't hunt or stop at a grocery store or even a drive through to find food. And somehow, miraculously, their clothes didn't wear out. Which means, as the younger ones grew older and their bodies grew bigger, miraculously their clothes must have grown as well. I know you might be thinking, this is no way, this is absurd, you cannot expect me to believe this, how can this possibly be? Well, I take your attention back to Genesis chapter 1 where we see over and over and over again, God said, God said, and God said, and he made things, he created things outside of the natural order of things. He set everything in motion. And our God, he's big enough to create everything that we see today, and he's big enough to provide for your daily sustenance, whatever that may be. We may not understand how he does it, but we can understand that he does do it. I'm going to read a quote from Dallas Willard from his book, Divine Conspiracy. He helps us understand a little bit deeper what this is all about. He says this, This God is master of all basic equations that govern reality, physical and otherwise, such as the famous E equals MC squared discovered by Albert Einstein. Here, E is energy, M is matter, and C is the speed of light. Now, from the human perspective, it is mainly matter that is available to us. To meet our needs, we are, within narrow limits, able to manipulate it to produce usable forms of energy by processes such as digestion, combustion, atomic fission, or fusion, and so forth. But to God, the energy side of the equation is also available. He has inexhaustible supplies of it. And so he can feed thousands by multiplying a few loaves and fish, or he can directly supply the physical needs of the body of one fasting with faith toward him. Our God is a big God. And if our God can speak and there is light, there is land, there are plants, there are animals, and then there is man, then it is not too much for us to expect and trust that he can and will provide for our needs each and every day. But lest there be a mistake here, please, nowhere in this passage or in all of Scripture, and certainly what I'm not encouraging you to do, is to seek after the manna. The manna is what God provides. Don't seek the manna. Seek the one who provides the manna. And his name is Jesus Christ. Who said in John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. 
Your forefathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What Jesus is telling us here is that he offers living bread that sustains us through all eternity. We likely will experience a physical death, but through Jesus Christ, we will not experience a spiritual death. And so what Scripture is telling us here is to eat living bread, you must accept Jesus Christ and become united with him by believing in his life, death, and resurrection and trusting him to provide as you live for him. This is under the sovereignty of our big God. This is what it means to turn our trust, our hope, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he will provide not just for our eternal spiritual lives, but he will also provide for us each and every day, including our physical needs. And so I close with this question. Are you in control of your appetites or are they in control of you? Hunger is a reality that every one of us faces. Not just physical hunger, but we have desires outside of the physical food we need We need as well. And my question is, who's in control of your life? And if it's not God, then we invite you today to choose him. Would you pray with me? Father, I ask your spirit to do in our hearts that of which we cannot do for ourselves. In fact, Father, our tendency is to ignore or to deny rather than to accept the reality. But Father, I would ask that your spirit would reveal to each and every one of us the reality of our own hearts this morning and to reveal to us in what ways we have been trusting in ourselves rather than trusting in you. That we would be honest enough about it to say it's true, to confess it before you, to seek your forgiveness, and to return to allowing you to truly be Lord of our lives. But perhaps, Father, in this room, there's someone or even many someones who have never made a decision to trust their life into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for them, the decision you've placed upon their heart, the decision for them to make today is to choose to believe in the life, the death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and to realize that you, Father, have sovereignly been watching over their lives and you have brought them to a point such as this that they would make this decision this day to choose to trust in you. And they can trust that you will providentially care for them from this point on as well. Well, Father, may your spirit speak to us. May we respond in faith and obedience that you would be pleased and you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.